Welcome to a new class in PEP's online course on policy impact analysis. We will now introduce the basics of sample size determination and power calculation for the design of randomized control trials. We will begin this class by reviewing a few important concepts related to impact evaluations, randomized control trials and hypothesis testing. We will then go on to define statistical power and present power and sample size calculations in practice. Based on this, we will examine the most important factors affecting power and sample size. To conclude, we will review common pitfalls at sample size determination and how to avoid them. Impact evaluations and RCTs. As we have seen in previous lessons, the main goal of impact evaluation studies is to determine the causal effect of a program on a certain outcome of interest. Ideally, this would require us to observe the counterfactual, the outcome that would have occurred for participants had they not participated in the program. As we already know that this is impossible, impact evaluations aim to approximate the average impact of a program on a group of individuals by comparing them to a similar group of individuals who were not exposed to the program. This group is called a control group. Through the random assignment of units to treatment and control groups, we can ensure that groups are comparable and that the causal impact of the program will be identified. This is why randomized control trials, RCTs, are the preferred method for impact evaluation, as we have seen in the previous session. To begin, it is useful to first present our notation. The causal impact of the program on a given outcome Y for an individual I is given by the difference between the outcome for this individual under treatment, denoted by Y sub I T, and the outcome for this individual under the control group, denoted by Y sub I C. Since we cannot observe both states for one individual, we attempt to find the expected average effect of the treatment in the population, that is, the expected value of this difference across all individuals. If the RCT is done well, we can approximate this magnitude as the difference in the empirical means of the treatment and control groups in our experimental sample. The regression counterpart to obtain d hat is given by equation 1 below, where t is a dummy variable that equals 1 if the unit has been treated. This equation can be estimated with OLS, and it can be seen that beta hat equals our magnitude of interest, that is, the difference between the empirical means of the outcome in the treatment and control groups. Hypothesis testing. Because beta hat is an estimate of a true parameter that we cannot observe, its validity is analysed using the method of hypothesis testing. This method entails setting a null hypothesis about the impact of the experiment and using the evidence to test its validity. The null hypothesis holds that the intervention has no effect. The alternative hypothesis holds that the treatment does have an effect on participants. If the evidence provided by the experiment allows us to reject the null hypothesis, we accept the alternative hypothesis. The following is an example of hypothesis testing applied to a tutoring intervention aimed at improving math scores among third grade students. The null hypothesis states the intervention does not affect test scores. Under the null hypothesis, the difference between the average math scores of the treated group and the control group is zero. The alternative hypothesis states that the intervention does affect test scores. Under the alternative hypothesis, the difference between the average math scores of the treated group and the control group is either positive 
or negative, but different from zero. This is why it is called a two-sided test. We reject the null hypothesis when the evidence from the experiment suggests that the difference between the means of the control and treatment group is statistically different. This means that the effect is unlikely to have occurred by chance. The degree of statistical significance is commonly denoted by the Greek letter alpha. It is normally set at a 5% or 1% level. A 5% significance level means that if the true effect were zero, the probability that we would observe a non-zero difference is less than 5%. Thus, we only reject the null hypothesis when the data shows that the chances of a non-zero effect being an accident are less than 5%. However, hypothesis testing is used precisely because we cannot observe the true effect of our experiment. This chart is a visual representation of the types of correct and incorrect conclusions that we can reach while testing a hypothesis. If the true effect exists and we are able to detect it, we find a true positive. If the effect does not exist and we find no effect, we find a true negative. If the underlying truth is that the program does not have an effect, but our hypothesis wrongly detects a significant effect, we are committing a type 1 error we are wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis, noted as H0. This error is called a false positive because we are wrongly proposing that the treatment works, when in reality it doesn't. The probability of committing a type 1 error is given by the significance level alpha. If the underlying truth is that the program does have an effect, but our hypothesis test fails to detect it and does not reject the null hypothesis, we are committing a type 2 error. We are wrongly failing to reject the null hypothesis. This error is called a false negative because we are failing to detect an effect that actually exists. The probability of committing a type 2 error is given by 1 minus power, and this is why achieving a proper level of power is so important in an RCT. An adequate level of power limits the probability of us failing to detect the effect of an intervention, provided that it exists. That said, Power is the probability that we will be able to detect an effect in an outcome provided that the effect occurred. Usual levels for power are set at 80% and 90%. 80% power means that if a real effect exists in the population, we will be able to detect it in 80% of the samples we draw from that population. The probability that we will fail to detect an existing effect is 20%. To achieve a desired level of power for our experiment, we need to select an appropriate sample size. This is where power and sample size calculations come in. Sample size will depend on desired level of power, 80%, desired level of statistical significance, 5% or 1%, the size of the effect we wish to detect, experiment design, and other considerations. When we think about the size of the effect we can expect to find in a program evaluation, we think about the minimum detectable effect. The minimum detectable effect, or MDE, is the minimum effect on the outcome of interest that we want to be able to detect at our desired significance level. It is commonly denoted by the Greek letter delta. It is the difference between the means of the outcome of interest between the treatment and control group. 
expressed in terms of the pretreatment standard deviation of the outcome for both groups. For example, in an educational intervention designed to improve test scores, we know from previous data that mean scores for our population of interest are 56 points. Based on related literature, we can expect our intervention to raise the mean scores of the treated group by 10 points. From previous data, we also know that the standard deviation of test scores is 8 points. Based on these values, the minimum detectable effect that we can expect to find is equal to 1.25 standard deviations. Expressing the MDE in terms of standard deviations allows for comparison among different interventions. Counterintuitive as it may seem, the MDE is a parameter that must be set ex ante before the experiment is run in order to calculate an adequate sample size. This means we need to find priors for the numerator and denominator. The difference between the means of the outcomes in the treatment and control groups must be drawn from similar studies in similar contexts. The standard deviation of the outcome variable must be drawn from baseline data or pre-existing local data sources such as household surveys. Ideally, the MDE should be set as small as possible, but not so small that it lacks economic relevance. For a given level of power, a smaller MDE will require a larger sample size because small effects are harder to distinguish from noise. The following is an example of a sample size calculation exercise for a nutritional intervention aimed at improving the height of eight-month-old girls. This example will help us understand how sample size calculations are carried out in practice. As we have seen, sample size determination requires us to set a desired level of power and a significant level. In this case, they are set at 80 and 5% respectively. The MDE must be set for the most important outcome of interest in the experiment. In this case, the most important outcome is the mean height of the subjects. The expected mean height for the control group is 70 centimetres, according to official tables published by the World Health Organization. A reasonable expectation for the minimum effect in height is 1.5 centimeters, based on similar studies carried out in comparable contexts. The standard deviation of the height of girls for the appropriate age bracket is 3.05, and it is obtained from official tables published by the World Health Organization. Finding an appropriate sample size in state of 15 can be done easily by using the power to means command. This command allows comparison between the means of the outcomes for the control and treatment groups. In this case, we want to decide whether the difference between them is zero, no effect, or different from zero, there is an effect. This is a two-sided means test. In order to proceed, we need to input the mean of the control group, the expected difference between the means, the standard deviation of the outcome, and the desired levels of statistical significance and power. Plugging these parameters into STATA15 is fairly simple. Once we plug in the parameters, we get the following results. The first part of the window restates the study parameters we entered. The last part, highlighted in blue, shows the total sample size and the sample size per group. It is also possible to output a graph depicting the relationship between power and sample size for a given MDE. We can see 
assume that for a given MDE, larger sample sizes mean more power. This plot shows power versus sample size for different sizes of MDE. When the size of the MDE varies, smaller MDEs require larger sample sizes to preserve power. This happens because smaller MDEs are harder to detect from noise. Aside from the MDE and significance level, multiple other factors affect sample size, SF, requirements for a given level of power. Attrition and non-compliance, randomization at higher levels, and subgroup analysis are factors whose presence require larger sample sizes. Stratification is a factor whose presence generally eases demands on sample size. Another factor affecting sample size is the type of outcome, whether binary or continuous, since it changes the formulae. All of these factors must be considered in sample size calculations in order to preserve the desired level of power. This requires making worst case scenario assumptions. A conservative, even pessimistic approach is recommended. Attrition and non-compliance. Attrition and non-compliance are major factors affecting sample size. Attrition occurs when outcome data cannot be collected for all units of observation because some of them drop out of the study. This is a form of reduction of the sample size, which causes a reduction in power. If attrition is not randomly distributed across the treatment and control groups, it can also affect internal validity. Non-compliance occurs when subjects do not respect the treatment or no treatment status assigned to them. This can take two forms. Subjects in the treatment group do not use the treatment or subjects in the control group somehow access the treatment. On top of directly reducing sample size, attrition and imperfect compliance can reduce the difference in outcome between treatment and control groups, which becomes more difficult to detect from noise. Thus, for a given sample size, they cause a reduction in power. In order to avoid the loss of power, Sample size must be set large enough to accommodate the presence of attrition and non-compliance. Calculations based on the zero attrition and non-compliance scenario are unrealistic and must be adjusted by the following ratio, where C and S are the rates of compliance and non-compliance in the control and treatment groups respectively. C and S should be set conservatively based on similar studies. This plot shows the required sample size to preserve an ideal level of power of 80%. If sample size calculations do not consider the presence of attrition and non-compliance, the experiment will not be powered at the ideal level. Instead, it will be powered at a lower level. This increases the chances of not being able to find an effect even when the effect exists. Subgroup analysis. Some evaluations intend to assess whether program impacts vary between strata, also called blocks, such as gender or regions. This occurs when there are good reasons to suspect that treatment effects are similar within subgroups, but different between subgroups. A common example can be found in financial inclusion studies that wish to understand how interventions can empower women. This requires assessing impacts in women versus impacts in men. In order to detect effects in each subgroup with sufficient power, our sample must contain a sufficient number of units of each subgroup. In the context of an RCT, where treatment is assigned in a random manner, randomization has to be carried out within subgroups. This means that we need to conduct power calculations separately for each subgroup. In our financial inclusion example, we need to find the sample size for women and for men separately. <laughs>
the final sample size will be the sum of the number of units required for each subgroup. During the inference stage, the regression must include subgroup indicator dummies and the interaction between subgroups and treatment effect. In the equation below, T represents treatment status and F is an indicator dummy that equals 1 if the subject is female. Eta represents the differential effect of treatment in females. Hypothesis testing on eta hat will provide evidence on whether the treatment effects differ among subgroups. Including only dummies but not considering subgroups at the time of randomization does not impede the analysis, but the results do not count as rigorous evidence. Randomization at higher levels. Another important factor affecting sample size calculations is the level of randomization. Randomization of the treatment assignment can be done at levels other than the unit of observation, which is usually the individual and which we identify as level 1. Higher levels of randomization can be households, schools, hospitals, communities and regions. These are called clusters. For example, in an educational intervention aimed at improving test scores, our level 1 will consist of students and our level 2 will consist of classrooms. We can randomise an intervention to improve math scores across schools, level 2, but still measure the impact on test scores at the pupil level, level 1. RCTs implemented at a level higher than the unit of observation are called Cluster Randomised Control Trials, CRTCs. Cluster-based designs can be more appropriate for a variety of reasons, such as treatment is defined at the cluster level, avoids spillovers, reduces non-compliance, or addresses ethical concerns, political restrictions and cost considerations. In cluster-based designs, the outcome of individual units belonging to the same cluster are correlated. In our example, all pupils in a classroom are taught by the same teacher. Given that the quality of teaching plays a part in explaining test scores, the test scores from pupils in the same class cannot be thought of as independent. The degree of relatedness among the outcomes of observational units within clusters is called intracluster correlation, ICC. It is equal to the proportion of total variance explained by within cluster variance. It is denoted with the Greek letter rho. Rho is bounded between 0 and 1. Higher values indicate stronger relatedness of units within clusters. Because the observed individual outcomes are not independent, cluster-based designs require larger sample sizes for a given level of power. Each observation contains less new information, which is why we need more data to preserve power. Higher intra-class correlation coefficients will require larger sample sizes. If the ICC is close to zero, Observations are practically independent, so less adjustment will be needed. Sample size calculations for a clustered RCT will determine the number of units per cluster n and or the number of clusters required j. If calculations fail to consider the existence of clusters, the experiment will be underpowered. The number of clusters will generally be more important for power than the number of units per cluster. This is because adding more units that are correlated among each other brings little new information to the sample. Like the MDE, the ICC is a parameter you need to set ex ante before the experiment is run. This means we will need to find a prior for the ICC by applying its formula to baseline data 
or pre-existing local data sources. If these are unavailable, sometimes priors can be found in related literature. When no priors are available, the reference for the ICC must be set conservatively high, usually at 0 0.4. The following is an example of a sample size calculation exercise for an educational intervention aimed at improving math scores among third grade students. Again, sample size determination requires us to set the desired level of power and statistical significance. The MDE must be set for the most important outcome of interest in the experiment. In this case, the scores obtained by pupils on maths tests. The expected mean score for the control group is 58 points out of 100, based on previous data. According to similar studies carried out in comparable contexts, a reasonable expectation for the minimum effect in scores is 10 points. The standard deviation of the scores is 7 points also obtained from previous surveys. It is important to consider that the study will be a clustered RCT. Treatment will be assigned at school level while outcomes will be measured at student level. There are approximately 20 third grade students per school. The intra-class correlation coefficient rho is 0.4. The goal is to determine the number of schools required. Again, plugging these parameters into STATA15 is fairly simple. The power to means command is used again, only this time we are adding some parameters related to the fact that we will be working with clusters. These are the cluster size ratio between control and treatment groups, the amount of units per cluster, and rho, the intra-class correlation coefficient. Once we plug in the parameters, we get the following results. The first part of the window restates the study parameters we entered. The last part, highlighted in blue, shows the number of clusters per group and the number of units per group. In this case, we need to include four classrooms in each group. This will render 80 pupils in each group, 20 per cluster. This chart depicts the relationship between the number of clusters and the intra-class correlation coefficient, rho. We can see that higher values of rho require a larger amount of clusters to preserve a given level of power. Stratification. Stratification is another important factor with a strong impact on sample size determination. Sometimes there are reasons to believe that the subgroup to which a unit belongs, based on a certain characteristic, is important to explain the outcome of interest. An example could be the gender of a child participating in a nutritional intervention designed to affect children's heights. If gender explains a big portion of the impact on height, it is important that the treatment and control groups contain similar numbers of units of each gender. Especially in small samples, simple randomization is sometimes unable to allocate a balanced number of units of each type in T and C groups due to pure chance. This can be overcome by first classifying units into strata and then assigning units to treatment and control within strata in a random manner. This procedure is called stratified random sampling or stratification. Because the variables used for stratification help to explain a portion of the variance of the outcome for a given level of power, Stratification will reduce sample size requirements. The regression analysis must always include dummy variables indicating the strata to which each unit belongs.
This practical example shows power calculations for an experiment where delta is 0.25, alpha is set to 0.5, and we have an 80% level of power. The software tells us that we will need 254 units in our trial, 127 in treatment and 127 in control. We can conduct the same experiment, this time stratifying on gender. In this case, from calculations on baseline data, we know that gender explains 30% of the total variation in outcome. By setting these parameters in the computer program, we get the required sample size. We can see the required sample size is 182 units. 91 male and 91 female. Within each group, half will be assigned to treatment and half to control. The total sample size required to preserve an 80% level of power is much lower under stratification. This happens because blocking by a variable that explains a big portion of the variation reduces noise, and that helps us detect any existing effect with more precision. Binary outcomes. The type of outcome variable in our study has strong implications on the formulae used to determine sample size. Sometimes the outcome variable of a study is not continuous but binary, stating only two possibilities. For example, the outcome of an education intervention might be whether or not a student drops out of school. The model for a binary outcome is slightly different than the model for continuous outcomes. Because the model is different, sample size calculations also require different formulae. Just like in the continuous case, to achieve a desired level of power, we need to select an appropriate sample size for our experiment. The sample size will depend on the desired level of power and statistical significance, the design of the experiment and the considerations we mentioned previously. However, instead of the MDE, sample calculations require us to specify the probability of success in the treatment group and the probability of success in the control group. We will now see an example of a sample size calculation exercise for an educational intervention aimed at boosting graduation rates among final year students. Again, sample size determination requires us to set the desired level of power and statistical significance. The MDE must be set for the most important outcome of interest in the experiment. This is whether or not a student graduates from high school at the end of her final year. The probability of success in the control group, based on administrative data, is 0.6. According to similar studies carried out in comparable contexts, a reasonable expectation for the probability of success for the treatment group is 0.75. It is important to consider that the study will be a clustered RCT. Treatment will be assigned at school level, while outcomes will be measured at student level. There are approximately 40 final year students per school. Intraclass correlation coefficient rho is 0.4. This time, we use the power to proportions command in Stata 15. The first parameters we enter are the probability of success in the control and treatment groups. We also enter parameters related to the fact that we will be working with clusters, such as the cluster size ratio between control and treatment groups, the amount of units per cluster, and rho, the intra-class correlation coefficient. Finally, we enter the desired level of significance and power. Once we plug in the parameters, we get the following results. The first part of the window restates the study parameters we entered. 
The last part, highlighted in blue, shows the number of clusters per group and the number of units per group. In this case, we need to include 64 schools in each group. This gives 2,560 pupils in each group, 40 per cluster. So far, we have covered the most important topics on power and sample size calculations. This section presents a series of common pitfalls that are usually reported in practice. Many of them stem from the mistake of being too optimistic about the things that can go wrong with the experiment. It is useful to be aware of these to avoid preventable complications that can lead to an underpowered study. 1. Skipping power calculations because sample size is fixed. When sample size or the number of clusters cannot be modified too much due to logistical restrictions, power calculations are even more important because they can help us determine whether it is worth running an RCT study at all. By plugging in the sample size and a reasonable level of power, they will tell us what is the minimum detectable effect that we will be able to detect with the sample size we have. If the resulting MDE is unreasonably large, the use of an RCT methodology might have to be reconsidered. 2. Calculating power for only one outcome of interest. Sometimes there are two or three outcomes of interest in an experiment. When this is the case, sample size calculations must be done for all of the important outcomes to make sure that inference for all main results is sufficiently powered. 3. Overestimating the minimum detectable effect. Intervention effects need time to manifest. It is important to consider the timeline and the nature of the intervention before deciding the magnitude of the MDE. Being too confident about the possibility of detecting a large MDE is a very common error in practice. Inputs for the MDE must come from local data sources or studies applied to similar contexts. Using data or related literature from developed countries when designing experiments for developing economies, or vice versa, should be avoided. 4. Underestimating the magnitude of attrition and non-compliance. This is a classic mistake that stems from being overconfident about common problems not affecting our experiment too much. Attrition and non-compliance are major threats to evaluation because they reduce the amount of units for which there is full information, thus reducing power. Overestimating compliance rates is a critical error since there is no way to rectify sample size after these problems occur. As such, informed oversampling is strongly encouraged, as well as other measures aimed at minimising attrition and non-compliance. Underestimating the magnitude of the intra-class correlation coefficient in cluster-based RCTs the intra-class correlation coefficient must be drawn from local data sources. If no priors are available, it must be set conservatively high at 0.4. If set too low, resulting smaller sample size will not be enough to preserve the desired level of power.